and welcome to The Embodied Psyche. My name is Hannah Bernstein, and I'm thrilled today to be interviewing Mikhail Savalev. He works for a plastic surgery institute as their consulting psychologist. Welcome, Mikhail. Hello, Hannah. Nice to meet you again, and a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really happy to have you here today as well. I think it's especially thrilling to do my first international interview. You're based in Moscow. Indeed, in Moscow, Russia. It's the capital of Russia, for those who don't know. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm just very curious. How did you first find your way into the work of psychology? Indeed, that's an interesting question. And um, my, simil- my story is in a way similar to yours. Before becoming a psychologist, I was also into arts. I studied photography at uh, a cinematography institute. Then I started to study photography as a contemporary art at another art school. And then I started to realize I want to have um, a higher education and um, the one I could apply more professionally and more securely, I should say. And my eye, my eyes kind of ended up on a psychology department at Moscow State University. And I decided to pursue this career. Uh, I got my degree from Moscow State University. It's uh, very um, kind of famous here in Russia, and it's considered to be a center of psychological sciences in Russia, our faculty. So it sounds as though aesthetics were a part of your personal orientation long before you began working at this Plastic Surgery Institute. Is that true? Indeed, yes. Uh, As I was interested in arts since my kind of teen years, um, yeah, I always had kind of appreciation for beauty and aesthetics. And I should say, I kind of have a feeling for that and also for music. So my, uh, even though we usually consider aesthetics to be something related to a visual experience, I think it also can be related to audio, right? To perception of sound. And probably partly that's due to my parents, uh, especially my mother, Uh, being a musician and um, uh, she is a professional pianist and from early uh, years I was raised to appreciate good music, good art. I mm, visited museums all the time and I I guess that's the influence that I've got uh, when I was raised as a kid. And when you work in this clinic with clients, with patients who come to this institute seeking shifts in their appearance, what do you notice? What comes up for people? You know, mainly patients come here for rejuvenation, right? That's the main category of patients. And those patients uh, are the healthiest ones because once um, females start to experience some deterioration of their appearance with age. I mean, the tissues start to lose their shape, they start to have some excess skin on some areas of the body, and they just want to look as they did like 10 or five years ago. And that's very healthy motivation for a surgery. And uh, the good thing is that that's the majority of patients. And uh, those patients are maybe are of age like 40, 50, 60 years or, or, or old, right? But also we have uh, um, some patients that are younger or that come from different kind of perspectives. That's once uh, those who want to change their appearance uh, despite it being normal, right? They just want Uh, either to make it better or to look different. Um, Yeah, and those patients are of more concern from psychological perspective because medically they don't have any indication to do the surgery, just aesthetic displeasement or how do they say, like dissatisfaction 
or with the appearance of theirs makes them to do the surgery. And um, as you're working with these clients, with these patients, are there ever times when it's your role to step in and say, no, I don't psychologically clear this person for this aesthetic enhancement? Uh, right, uh, indeed. Um, that um, doesn't purely depend on me, and it shouldn't. So each patient we consider with a board of specialists, right? And um, we kind of make a common decision. And uh, my vote in this common decision is usually valued because I can give some insights that other professionals can't have. Uh, apart from psychological evaluation, people undergo undergo several other examines, like they do blood work and uh, they check for all the contradictions for the surgery, like being medical ones, and uh, especially surgeons consider medical history of a patient and the history of um, surgeries, plastic surgeries that has been already made. That's a very important factor for a surgeon to make a decision whether to operate a patient or not, because risks skyrocket with each consequent surgery. Complications are, are of higher risk. So then after we all evaluate the patient, uh, we kind of try to make a weighted decision um, that would indicate how suitable this person is to undergo go a surgery and to have a good prospect on a good result and, and, and being satisfied with the result. Because we want so that both parties, the clinic and the patient, uh, at the end are just satisfied with what they did. We don't want either of them or both of them to have some issues with the result, right? So ideally, we want everyone to be happy. And uh, especially my uh, job and my insights are uh, helpful to find exactly those patients who have very good prospects of satisfying both sides. So it's very clear that you're a critical part of evaluation before the surgery takes place. Is right. there any follow-up or aftercare or integration post-operation? Indeed. So after a patient makes a surgery, so he has been operated on, then uh, he's obligated to stay at the clinic for a few days. It usually ranges from three to 10 days. And during the times, uh, patients are in a vulnerable condition because they experience post-surgical pain because um, the procedure itself is very invasive. And if you want, we can then include some pictures of uh, of the actual surgery so that your viewers can judge how invasive the, the procedures are. So they're quite invasive. So um, plastic surgery is still surgery and, and very serious surgery. So after the procedure, patients may experience pain, complications, the swelling of the parts that has been operated on and uh, even hematomas, right? Some um, uh, other kind of medical conditions related to the tissue being damaged, right? Um, so, and even uh, after the surgery, they usually wear all those um, white, I forgot how to say it in English, like um, they, they wrap uh, the heads with, uh, how do they call it? Gauze, God. right. Yeah. So, and they change it each day or several times per day. And uh, if accidentally uh, the patient sees it himself in a mirror, 
they usually shocked because they look that, like they were beaten severely. They have bruises and stuff, they're swelled, and that's not what they expect after all. And uh, that's one of the reasons they can experience some kind of shock and, and uh, uh, I don't know, even a traumatic experience uh, looking at themselves. But that's purely normal for patients that have undergone a surgery. And it can last for about a month or more. And uh, it's critical that patients are prepared for that, are prepared to kind of deal with that and expect that. Uh, they can't expect to return to work, for example, in, uh, just after they and go uh, out of the doors of the clinic because they need some rest, they need to recover uh, so that nobody wants being seen that he, does, uh, he has done the surgery, right? Uh, especially females uh, usually prefer to keep it confidential. Mm, that's very interesting. I wonder if there are some cultural differences from country to country around the permissibility socially of these kinds of procedures. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles and uh, I, I haven't had plastic surgery myself, but I know several people who have. Um, and I think that we have fewer regulations here. I don't know that psychological counseling is an integrated part of treatment in general, like legally required here. And then I can think also of, of countries like South Korea, where it's like a very acceptable part of culture. There's a very high percentage of people who get um, plastic surgery to enhance their appearance. Um, so I guess I'm kind of curious in Russia, is it common? It, like, are, is it? A, I, I'm, I'm thinking of places in America where, um, in Long Island, it's almost expected that like women will get nose jobs and like late in high school as like a birthday present. I mean, it's not it's not common. Common. It's not the majority, but that's like a cultural mm -hmm. trope. Um, how how common is it for people to get plastic surgery in Russia? I'm saying that a limiting factor on uh, plastic surgery seekers, on a number of plastic surgery seekers is actually a financial one. Because I guess if m more people had the means to do the surgery, uh, the more would, right? Um, but I guess that uh, um, the fact that um, kind of our country and our people aren't very kind of rich, I should say, uh, that we don't see kind of mass plastic surgery or uh, it's simply because the prices are high here. I don't know, as compared to an average salary. So if, for example, we take an average salary in Moscow, which is about, I don't know, like $1,000, it's that's an average or a mean, I, I don't know. And uh, a face surgery, rejuvenation face surgery might cost about twenty, thirty thousand dollars So it's like uh, 20, 30 months worth of your average salary. So that means that an average person uh, can't allow himself to do a surgery that easy. But we do have patients for whom like 20 or Two hundred thousand dollars. It doesn't make much difference. Like they are willing to pay whatever you require, and uh, that's kind of a difference. I don't think it's necessarily uh, only applicable to applicable to Russia. I guess you can find such diversity anywhere in the world, uh, and um, I guess in Los Angeles too, right? Especially plastic surgery is usually reserved for people who have some um, uh, careers in uh, film industry and music industry, right? Um, yes, often either that or people with aspirations for that. So I don't know if this is a difference between the United States and Russia, but we have like a pretty um, permissive credit society. So it's, it's very possible to go into twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 worth of debt for a plastic surgery, but people at every um, income level, I think, do that with the hope that in the future, you know, the new appearance will propel their career in some manner. Um, 
I'm not saying that that's like, again, a very commonplace thing, but it, it happens, you know, so there's a lot of advertisements here in Los Angeles, even for um, things like, you know, they'll advertise like a lunch break, um, uh, freeze the fat kind of procedure, you know, so there's all kinds of like quick in and out m body modification that theoretically is less invasive, but, um, you know, still, I think, a substantial impact upon the body. So there's a little bit of a culture here, and I think other places like Miami, um, places where people are exposing themselves uh, a little bit more because it's warmer weather, where there's a huge emphasis on the appearance of the body, on beauty, and um, that gets advertised to people in every economic sphere. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's a thing that happens in Russia that people go into debt to enhance their appearance, but it definitely happens here in the United States. Yeah, from my experience, debt culture or credit culture, as you say, is not very common or developed in Russia as it is in the United States. For example, me personally, I have never took anything for credit. I don't know, I just prefer to live uh, on kind of the basis that what I can afford right now. I don't want to kind of loan money uh, for some advancements I can do now. And I guess this kind of um, scheme or strategy, I should say, are uh, also applicable for the majority of Russian people. Certainly there is a difference between the United States and Russia in that regard. Yeah, I'm curious. I know you've had, I believe you said, six years of education to become a, a psychologist right. in Russia. Was that a substantial investment? Is education expensive in Russia? Yeah, the very kind of um, uh, interesting thing is that I got it for free. And uh, it's amazing that in Russia we can get a very quality education for free is the government pays for you, right? If you pass, we can have a system where you have a competition to enter a uh, university on this uh, budget uh, places, as they call them here. So university allows, like for example, half of the students that score best on the entrance exam to take the education for free. Uh, and even you are paid uh, not substantial money after all, but during the years you study, and if you have good marks, you are paid by the government some, uh, uh, I forgot how they said, loans, student loans, right? That's fantastic. So not only are you getting your education for free, but you're also getting living expenses from the government. Right. Yeah, and, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, and after I got my degree from the university, I also applied for this PhD program I study on right now. So it's already eight year at my kind of degree right now. So I got it also for free. And if you aren't getting it for free, I can just uh, give you a sense of prices they require from students uh, to get a psychology degree here, for example, at Moscow State University. So it's about uh, $10,000 per year or, or something like that. Yeah, that's actually much um, less than in the United States. Um, it's probably at least five times that amount for a year of education at a university here. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely crazy. It's yeah. difficult to imagine because maybe we have, um, even though we have less uh, amount, kind of, we have lower salaries here in Moscow, but also we have less expenses. So everything is cheaper here. So uh, everything being equal, we kind of, um, I should guess, have a similar experience of life because if you go to a shop, uh, the prices are lower. You have a cheaper, like um, electricity. I don't know, gas, internet, uh, or whatever. Rent Everything probably. is cheaper. Housing yeah, yeah. probably. The yeah. food is is cheaper. So, and also the taxes are lower. So wow. 
Yeah, I mean, we we talk a lot about having um, a desire or an ideal of a merit-based society here, you know, where people based on their aptitude, based on their intelligence can make for themselves a good life, no matter what the circumstances of their birth. But the reality seems to be, especially in elite professions, you know, pursuing a graduate degree, for example, um, a huge barrier to entry is cost. Um, so there are a few universities, very, very elite universities that will pay people to achieve their graduate degree, but it's exceptionally competitive. Um, and it sounds as though in Russia, there's a little bit more of that opportunity to, if you have the interest and the aptitude, find your way into a high earning profession or a, or a respectable profession. Right. Certainly, as you say, there is more opportunity here in Russia, even if you are for uh, if you were raised in a family that uh, haven't got much resources, right, to pay for your education. And uh, this way, we usually have some uh, students uh, from outskirts of Russia, like from everywhere around Russia. And uh, they come to Moscow and they, the university gives them dormitories to live, even though they are on, of not uh, very uh, comfort, uh, not very comfortable, but still they allow them to live in Moscow, to study at Moscow and uh, uh, kind of uh, universities put all their bets on a talent of a person and they are willing, they are willing to pay for him, uh, hoping, hoping that over the years, the person will return to the economy by uh, providing, by working, by uh, figuring out some new ways uh, and uh, new technology to make life uh, better in Russia. I don't know. But That's the fantastic. sad thing, yeah, but a bit sad thing is that usually the brightest students, they actually immigrate. Once they get an education here, they immigrate, for example, to the United States because uh, they are so brilliant and uh, it's not a problem for them to find a job somewhere in Silicon Valley and um, have a salary of like 100 times uh, higher than here. And um, this way, kind of the brightest minds sometimes leave Russia. But, uh, also kind of uh, on a positive side, it seems that the trend now uh, lowers uh, and um, things are getting better here and not everyone is willing to immigrate. Mm. Earlier this week, I was on um, your uh, live stream and one of mm -hmm. the things we discussed was uh, status, as you just mentioned, uh, but from a different perspective, the way that beauty, the way that aesthetics seem to um, shift status in what sometimes gets referred to as the sexual marketplace. I'm wondering if you'd be able to speak to that a little bit, maybe from the perspective of one of your younger clients who's seeking uh, plastic surgery to shift their beauty. Right. Uh, so I will just uh, recap it um, in a few sentences. So indeed, uh, we can consider um, human relations and especially inter intersexual dynamics, meaning uh, the relationship between opposite sexes, uh, we can compare it, this process to an economy, to a market economy, where we have something to sell uh, and we have buyers that can also kind of we have an exchange economy where you have something for something in exchange right and um, your something is worth of something uh, right and we can estimate this worth in uh, in a, a simple ten uh, tenfold scale from one to ten right and uh, researchers came up with this idea of a sexual marketplace, meaning where a pool of people, both male and females, where each individual has a, cer a certain sexual market value expressed in terms of, uh, of, of a one to 10 scale. 
And um, as you know, you, um, within this example, you can imagine that to any person, uh, to any female or to any male, we can assign a certain number from one to 10 expressing their desirability for us, right? And imagine we have uh, a certain male, for example, and we take 100 females and ask them all to rate this male or from on the scale from one to 10, and they are gonna do the job, right, to rate him. And then we, we take the average, and this average will determine uh, the sexual market value of this particular male in the social in the sexual marketplace, and it's inc incredibly accurate uh, this number. And uh, imagine we do it for all the pool of people in our population, and then we have uh, kind of certain stratification uh, of uh, our population there. And um, if we then do a factor analysis uh, to figure out what determines uh, the preference uh, and uh, the, se the sexual market value, value for a certain individual, right? So why is this particular man has 10 and the other one has six, right? We, we will study both of the, those males, right? And try to figure out what exactly is the difference between those two men that makes females to rate this man as six and this one as 10. And we're going to do this uh, statistical procedure called factor analysis, where we collect lots of data about each individual, for example, their income, their height, their weight, their age, uh, I don't know, their level of boldness, I don't know, their facial symmetry, they don't know, the color of their eyes, every possible factor, right? And we measure it all. And when, then we're going to statistically analyze it all with procedure called factor analysis. And we are going to have a table where it says, here first we have like social status determines like, I don't know, 60% of uh, this uh, sexual market value. Then we have like, I don't know, height, or I'm just speculating, right? Mm, mm, but height is a very uh, powerful uh, attraction marker for females and males. So, and um, as you understand, the factor analysis for females and males is gonna be very different. We're gonna have different factors and at least a different order. For uh, as uh, the main difference is that for males, on, on the first ranking factor, is certainly going to be social status and resources. Uh, after, uh, but as compared to females, where the first factors are going to be physical attractiveness uh, and use and fertility, those three. And after that, they're going to be education, I don't know, also social status, uh, and I don't know, income, uh, and so forth. But the difference is that every factor matters, but the degree to which it matters to males and females is different. That's the, the main difference, uh, the difference in uh, uh, all this um, idea I'm explaining uh, mm -hmm. about uh, s a sexual market value for females and males. I'm curious, in this research, in this data, are we just looking at that sexual market value that you spoke to, that number on a one to 10 scale that determines when you're averaging the opinions of 100 people, how many want to have sex with you or partner with you? Uh -huh. Or are we also measuring in some way outcomes? Like I wonder, for example, are people with a higher sexual market value happier? Do they find themselves with kinder partners? What, are there outcomes that are measured, or are we just looking at that um, attractiveness to others? Of course, um, attractiveness to our others is a kind of a necessary component of happiness, right? Uh, uh, if you aren't going to be, uh, if nobody is attracted to you, I don't think you're going to be very happy about it if you don't have an underlying pathology that you are like an extremely extrovert, autistic person. I don't know. Uh, but well, this we, is, uh, 
I'll, I'll let you finish. All, all, yeah, yeah. No, we um, always talk about trends here. Of course, we have exceptions, right? But in general, people tend to be happier once they feel validated and they feel that people are attracted to them. And lots of people are attracted to them. It's like um, a heron for people, right? And that's why people always seek power and they always seek popularity because it's a very good feeling when like thousands, millions of people appreciate you and love you. That's why um, uh, it's very attractive and especially for females they that's why they are very prone to get validation on social media with all those likes uh, they certainly seek that yeah so i i want to acknowledge the truth of much of what you've said you know all of these things are definitely contributing factors that said um my opinion differs from you in in some significant ways um admittedly i have not done um you know, quantitative research in this area. I haven't. What I have done is I've grown up in Los Angeles. You know, I have female clients. I've been in a lot of environments with people, um, women mostly, who've had um, significant eating disorders. And I also, in my grad school job, I worked um, at a high-end lingerie shop. So I was in the fitting room all the time with women and their bodies, you know, women talking about their bodies. And what I noticed in them was that the closer you got to an aesthetic ideal, the closer you looked like, you know, a, a movie star in Los Angeles who'd be seen as a sex object, the more insecurity and negativity these women seemed to have about their own appearance. There was a really intense fixation on the slight, slight ways in which they deviated from the ideal of perfection. Um, and I think partially this almost neurotic drive towards beauty is what motivated them to put a lot of time into grooming, put a lot of time into exercise, things of this nature. Um, but also, I didn't see them as very happy people. And in my own life, in my own experience, I've had you know, some weight fluctuations and I've had fluctuations in my degree of uh, attention I placed on grooming. So there have been times in my life when, you know, I used to... Uh, do a little bit of like amateur modeling. You know, I was, I was someone who fit a little bit of that bill. Um, and then times in my life, like now when I don't place a lot of my time and energy on pursuing that perfectionistic ideal, I, I do place emphasis on, you know, grooming and, and being presentable, but that's not a fixation in my life in the way that it was at certain times. So I know for myself that as I've developed things other than aesthetic beauty, even though aesthetic beauty might be the thing that's most appealing to men in the sexual marketplace. I've found that I'm more personally happy and also I attract partners who are less shallow. So the times in my life when I was closer to an aesthetic ideal, I felt like I found partners who mirrored my low self-esteem and were similarly critical of my appearance. So when I work with clients, I'm usually not advising them to increase their sexual market value. I'm advising them instead to focus on more intrinsic qualities of happiness, which I believe will serve them better in the long run. Yes, but the curious thing is that um, um, what you said in no way contradicts uh, what uh, my ideas. And let me explain why. Just you, you took a bit uh, different approach, and uh, I will explain why it happens. Uh, um, uh, everything you said. So uh, you said that if we have like a female that is a ten in eyes of man, right? And I would certainly agree that that kind of female might experience real psychological issues and even disorders of some sort and be unhappy. Why? Because um, she, pu she, has, um, she puts all her bets on physical attractiveness. That's why she was able to maintain this uh, mark of 10, right? And... Um, we also should understand that this number during a life of a female or a man, it fluctuates, it's never constant. And uh, subconsciously females realize that, okay, now I'm 10, right? 
but a few years later, I'm, I'm going to be seven or I'm, I might lose it. And this constant, constant struggle of trying to maintain this high perfection, which is actually uh, doesn't need it that much. Uh, you don't need to be a 10 to be a happy person or to attract other partners. It's kind of an extreme already, right? And usually at the extremes, you, you encounter some issues. So um, once you are eight or nine, I think there is more balance between uh, being uh, happy and more kind of relaxed uh, psychologically and uh, more grounded rather than sick perfection. It's like in sport, right? Or with physical activity. Uh, for health, right? For just physical health, it's okay to just walk 10,000 uh, steps per day and you are covered, right? But with an achievement sport, like on Olympics, you go way overboard that recommendation yeah, for a certain achievement, for a certain score. And the health of such athletes, it's a great danger. And you, they are usually deteriorate their health very quickly. And uh, do you understand this analogy? Yes, it makes perfect sense to me. I love it. It also reminds me of um, something my friend Alex Cohen said once that I found really amusing, which was any seven can become a personal 10. And I think we also have research to support that, that if we are attracted to someone, if we love someone, if they're around all the time, we, our brains respond to their faces in more and more positive ways over time. So beauty can be in the eye of the beholder, but you have to you know, have that relationship established. Right. And also, I was always very curious about the gap that might, might exist, uh, may exist between perceived sexual market value as you perceive yourself and uh, the actual one, uh, the ones that you get from averaging uh, other people's opinions of you. And that's basically where uh, if uh, your perception is, uh, if you perceive yourself as a 10, but in reality you are 6, I don't know how it's going to manifest itself in, in, in reality. Uh, in some ways, it might be beneficial to you because you might uh, eventually end up with something like 8 because you average like 6 and 10 and something like 8 because you become so confident in yourself so that you carry yourself like you are an 8, right? <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> I love but, that. But uh, in, in some ways, um, uh, it can make you a bit delusional about what... Uh, are you, what can you expect? It's like, I don't know, you have a few bucks uh, in your pocket and you go to like Mercedes shop to shop for a sports car, right? <laughs> um, it, it, can, it can make you delusional a bit. So I think uh, the most beneficial uh, strategy is to have your perception of yourself a score or two scores higher than it actually is, but no higher. <laughs> That's great. We should all be a little bit deluded about our attractiveness. Um, yes. I love that. Okay, that's a good takeaway from this. Let's all uh, see ourselves through the eyes maybe of someone who loves us rather than what the, the general populace would think of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also, um, once uh, you are able to perceive yourself in a not delusional way, you start to make some changes and some self-improvements to up high the sexual market value from the one you have now uh, to the, the one you want to achieve, right? And it's certainly possible. And uh, returning to our main topic, plastic surgery is one of the ways, very kind of uh, promising ways to increase your sexual market value for females. Mm. Indeed, it does that, especially if the surgery is done well and uh, it's done professionally and without much, um, uh, as they say, sur the best surgery is not noticeable one. Mm. So people and have you just seen that? Have yeah, you seen that for your clients? Like people whose course, lives yeah, have every day. Better? Uh, immensely, they, they change immensely, and it's, it's usually such a refreshment for a person. They suddenly, um, as, as, you know, I, I like this analogy. You know, when uh, you 
have these domino cubicles, right? And then you like flip one and it uh, changes the whole kind of uh, chain of events, causes the whole chain of events. The same thing as plastic surgery, it's like a stochastic process that is initiated by this plastic surgery and uh, your life kind of direction might bet, um, change its trajectory to a more positive way because you suddenly um, imagine as we all again return to this sexual market value and how you perceive yourself. So yesterday it was a sex, uh, but next month or two, you are eight, right? And um, it, it has such a confidence boost for you, right? You suddenly discover a whole world of opportunities for yourself that you are happy to uh, and willing to pursue and to try. And um, it results usually in people finding some uh, new ways to live their lives, new jobs, I don't know, new partners, um, and many more. Fascinating. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mikhail, for taking the time to talk with me today. I've really valued this conversation. It's been a really um, educating experience about both Russian culture and also um, some of the science of aesthetics. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah, for interviewing me. Uh, I should comment on a very professional uh, manner you do that. And uh, it's uh, a pleasure for, for me to just uh, have a conversation with you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I really appreciate that.